tell the story. I love how you pick me up every time I'm down. Then you set my feet on higher ground.
you for your love today. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for calling us by your name.
this morning, this wonderful, this glorious God, this eternal God. Lord Jesus, we extol you this morning. We lift you up on high. We bless your holy, wonderful name, O God. We bring you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise that belongs to you. We thank you, wonderful Savior, for such a an opportunity to stand in your presence, the presence of the eternal God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, to give you glory, to give you honor, to give you praise. Oh, we do not take your presence for granted, Lord. We thank you for your presence in our midst. We bless you this morning. Come on, people of God. Come on. He is King of kings, worthy of praise, worthy of glory, worthy of honor. Hallelujah. 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 You know, sometimes I wonder about us as children of God. You know, if the President of the United States were to walk in this building, we would be clapping so loudly, we would be shouting, we would be recognizing the President of the United States. But the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the God of all creation, let's not take His presence for granted. That's what the Bible says, oh shout unto the Lord, all ye people. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Clap your hands, he says. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. One of the things you must understand is God sent Jesus Christ into this world to establish a relationship with himself amongst a people. The devil, on the other hand, chose to invent religion so that people will stay away from a relationship with God. And if you look into all the religious denominations of the world, you will see that when people come in, oh, they have to look holier than thou. But holiness is not just a look. Holiness is a condition of heart. And we do it God's way. And the Bible says, Psalm 37, Oh, clap your hands, some of you people. No, it, it's all or some. See, that's where we can measure relationship with God. When we choose to work in, walk in obedience to the Word of God, that's how we measure relationship, you know. There are all kinds of relationships. Now the Bible says, Oh, clap your hands, all ye people, shout unto the Lord with a voice of triumph. That's the word of God. Yes, Lord Jesus, it is unto you, unto you who delivered us from the clutches of Satan and has set us free to worship you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. God bless you richly. The rest of you will get it. It took me some time to get to there. I too was very inhibited when it came to doing what God says. But now, thank God. I'm free because I'm freed by the Son of God. And the Bible says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Hallelujah. Oh, I feel like preaching this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. God bless you richly. You may be seated. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. Give me a little monitor, please. And for those of you who were baptized yesterday, we normally ask you to sit up front so that I can look you eyeball to eyeball and minister to you specifically because we know that the enemy, we know that the enemy is going to try everything to dissuade you in your walk with the Lord. 
we see this happening to Jesus himself. When Jesus was baptized, the Bible tells us he was led of the Spirit, the Spirit of God, into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Temptation will come. Temptation is not a sin. If temptation were a sin, Jesus would have sinned because he was tempted. So that temptation is not a sin. It is when you yield to the temptation. And I see that we have baptized quite a number of young people yesterday. It's not that old ones can't be tempted, perhaps even more. But the fact of the matter is you have begun a journey and uh, it is how you finish that journey that will depend on your reward. The Bible tells us the race is not for the swift, but he that endure it to the end. And this walk is an enduring walk. It's a race that can't be run too fast. You have got to take your time. You can't mark time, and you can't get ahead of time. But it is not for the swift. It is for those that will endure to the very end. This morning, I want to talk to you ab about a walk that you have got to walk. And it's called, the title is Walking to Your Wealth in Christ. Walking to your wealth in Christ Jesus. Before we commence our walk to our wealth, since it's not going to be a walk in the park, it's not going to be an easy walk, I can't lie, because of the fallen nature that we possess and we would carry around until such time that we die. This fallen nature is going to be used by Satan to cause us to do things that are contrary to the way that God would have us do, or the word of God. So there's always going to be a battle. There is always going to be a battle. The old man fighting against the spirit that is redeemed by the spirit of God, by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that battle is going to wage until such time that we die. The only difference is that as you fight the good fight of faith, even though the battle intensifies, it will not have the impact that it would have normally upon you. Because as you fight the fight of faith, you should be growing stronger and stronger and stronger. So in ministering to you on this title, Walking to Your Wealth in Christ, let's turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. And you would see that we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings, heavenly blessings in Christ Jesus. Let's look at it. Ephesians chapter 1. The author is Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ. Not because he does, did like what so many do today, call themselves apostles and they are not, but he was an apostle by the grace of Jesus Christ. He says, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he begins to praise God. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who had blessed us with some spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Do you see that there? Yes. What do you see there? All. You see all. Who have blessed us with all 
spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus according as he has chosen us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good will of his, the pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his Father, wherein he has accepted us in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he had abounded towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he had purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his will that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believe you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Before we commence our walk to our wealth in Christ, as I said before, since it is not a walk in the park, it's no easy walk, let us take a look at the wealth first. Let us take a look at the wealth that we are walking to so that we can be inspired and encouraged to complete the walk and so benefit the wealth. If we talk about the walk first, and then the wealth after, you may say that the walk is too hard. And you may give up on the wealth. But I know that if we be have before our eyes the wealth, and it's appeasing to us, then we're going to walk the walk. How many of you will agree with me that we all love wealth? Let me see your hands. Only a few of you. Oh my goodness. I want you to follow me and let us look at this wealth that we are blessed with in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Through his inspired word by the Apostle Paul. We read in verse 3. And stay with me in your Bibles because we are going through right on to 12, stage by stage. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who had blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, the natural mind, when we speak of wealth, the first thought that is immediately conjured up in our minds is that of financial resources. When we speak of wealth, the first thought that will be conjured in our minds is that of financial resources. But I want, us to, I want to say to you this morning very emphatically, that all the valuables in the world put together could not compare with the wealth that is contained in that verse of Scripture. It cannot be compared. If all the wealth of the world, the financial resources, were to put together, it cannot compare with the wealth, the spiritual blessings that God has ordained for his children 
here as we read in verse 3. I want us to take careful note that we are not blessed with some spiritual blessings in heavenly places. We are blessed with what? All. All the financial experts coming together in this world could not quantify these blessings that God has blessed us with in Christ Jesus. I want to say that again. All the financial experts in the world could not quantify these blessings that God has blessed us with in Christ Jesus. Listen to what the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 1, 2 and 9. I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have it entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. What the Bible is saying is we cannot even imagine, we can't comprehend the blessings in heavenly places that God has already predestined for us. But the Bible continues, but God had revealed, us, revealed it unto us by his Spirit. So let us now continue in the Word and see this most wonderful, this most spiritual, heavenly, eternal riches which are ours through grace in our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at verse 4. Blessing number one. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundations of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Each one I'm going to repeat just so that we can get it ingrained in our spirit. You see, it is one thing to listen to the Word of God. It is one thing to read the Word of God. But it's another thing to let the Spirit of God take that Word and place it into your spirit, deposit it into your spirit, so that you have an understanding of what God is saying. According that he has chosen us in him. When? When you got saved? No. Before the foundations of the world. That we should be holy and without blame and without blame before him in love. So loved ones, let us understand. I know it's it surpasses our natural understanding. But let us try to understand this aspect of wealth which the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ have blessed us with in heavenly places. Before the foundations of the world was laid, and that word their world in the Greek is, let me see if I can pick it up here, cosmos, which means earth. So we're talking about before the foundations of the earth was laid. And we know that that took place at the same time that the universe was created. Now we're not going into the question of the universe because that could take a lot of time. But we're talking about billions and billions and billions and untold billions of planets out there that the eye cannot see. And before God created any such thing, when the universe was just empty, when it was just God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit, 
Before the angels were created, God predestinated. What does that mean? It means that he decided beforehand that he was going to do the things that we are going to be talking about here this morning. Things that concern you. Things that concern you. Things that concern me. Before the foundations of the earth was laid, the Bible tells us that he had chosen us, chosen us, and predestinated the choosing that we would be holy and without blame before him in love. Let us not think, fool ourselves into thinking that this choosing was as a result of any good thing that we would have done. Any good thing that we could ever have done. In his omniscience, looking down through the corridors of time, he would have seen all the wrong things you did. All the wrong things I did. The sinful things. The abominable things that we would have done. God in his omniscience, he would have known all these things about us. He would have known of our wretchedness. But, but before we came, before the earth was created, before the universe was created... He decided that he was going to choose us sinners unto himself. Now, if that is not a heavenly blessing, I don't know what else is. We could not earn it. We could not deserve it. We weren't even here. But he decided that he was going to choose us. This holy, holy, holy God, in his sovereignty, decided in eternity past to choose us in his very own, only begotten Son. Do you understand what that means? That we as sinners, wretched as we are, that he was going to choose us out of this world so that we could be holy and without blame. How was this going to be? He decided. And I, I want to bring it home, you know. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit of God, the three persons of the Trinity. So working together in perfect harmony as one. The Father says to his Son, Son, we are going to put man upon the face of the earth, and we know because we know all things even before they happen, we know that man is going to disobey us, and they're going to sin. But we are going to choose them. And you, my son, you are going to have to die a very miserable death. You are going to have to be persecuted. You are going to have to be tortured. You are going to have to be crucified. You willing, son? Jesus in looking down through the corridors of time because he's God, he's omniscient. 
saw what condition we would be in if he did not do what he would have done, what he was told to do. And he says, sure, Dad, I'll take it on. Came to earth and gave his life so that we are chosen in Jesus Christ. And God have predestined that we wretched people will be holy and without blame. This is a twofold condition of his choosing. The first one is that we would have been, we who would have been wretched sinners separated from him would be presented to him as holy and without blame. In the eyes of God, this is how God will see us as a result of what his son will do. God will see the sinner as holy. He will see the sinner as without blame because of the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. It's called positional sanctification. The second condition is that as a result of our salvation in Christ. Now, we have to understand all this is long before we came. We're talking about predestination before the universe was created. God had it all planned. He had you in mind. He had me in mind. The second condition is that as a result of our salvation in Christ, we should be holy. That is separated from the ways of the world unto him and without blame in his eyes. This is progressive sanctification. This is what you've got to work towards. This is what the preaching of the word is all about. This is what the conviction of the Holy Spirit is all about. To get us to work towards that. So that we can come into the blessings. Considering our past lives in the eyes of a holy, holy God. And the indwelling sinful nature that we possess. This in itself is a wealth that all valuables in the world cannot compare with. That us sinners could be considered by a holy, holy God as never having sinned, as holy, without blame. This is one of the wealth, the blessings that we have already had positioned for us before time began. Before time began. Before time began. We can't comprehend that because we are a product of time, but God is not a product of time. He's a timeless God. And before time began, God had all this in mind. It didn't happen when you got saved. It didn't happen when we were baptized. So we see in the first blessing was that he chose us in Christ Jesus. The second one is found in verse 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good will of his pleasure. In effect, God in eternity past decided that he was going to adopt us. Now the choosing is one thing. But we are talking about an adoption now. He is going to adopt us. Uh, who would be sinners. Uh, remember, this is before time began. It's a decision. He decided this is predestination. He was going to adopt us as his own children. This is the God who created the heavens and the earth. This is the eternal God, the God without a beginning or without any ending. This is the almighty God. He's going to look down on this 
earth one day in, in time to come and see a people that he will choose that already are chosen and he's going to adopt them as his own very children? Oh, you're not excited about that? You see, we take our salvation so much for granted. We think it's the be-all and end-all when we come to church and we pay our tithes. We must sit down and think about this God, what he has done for us, what he means to do for us. We must think that he planned all this long before we came on the scene. If we can really conceptualize this, then we would begin to fall in love with him in the way that he says we should love him with all our hearts, all our minds, our soul, our being, with every fiber of our being. I said that once. We say we are children of God with such ease. Oh, I'm a child of God. But do you really comprehend the full value of being a child of one who created the heaven and the earth? A child of God? Do we really comprehend the value of that? So that when he says that he would adopt us as a children, this adoption is not in the sense as we know it in the Western world. When you take an orphan and you bring the child into your own home and treat it as your own. That's not the kind of adoption here. This adoption that we have been predestined to is that of being legitimate sons and daughters. Legitimate sons and daughters of the one who created the heaven and the earth. Listen to John 1, 12. But as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become, what? The sons of God. Even to them that believe in his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We are born children of God. We are a child of God. We are children of God by birth. And he has set it so long before time began. We are talking about predestination. We are not talking about the time when we got saved, when we came to the altar or wherever, that God decided to do this for us long before time began. This is what God planned for you. This is what he planned for me. It's called predestination. We are literally born of God. We are his children. As many as receive him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. Not by the will of man, not by blood, not by the will of the flesh, but of God. Legitimate children born of God. If that is not a heavenly blessing, I can't imagine what is. But it does not stop there. This God that we serve is such a good, good, good God. It doesn't even stop. As if that is not enough, it does not stop there. Listen to verse 7. In whom we have redemption. Now, all this is predestined. I want you to keep this uppermost in your mind. All this is predestined by God. He, had it. he, he wrote the book and he completed the book and we're just living it now. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So look, we have two heavenly blessings right there. One, we have redemption and we have the forgiveness of sins. 
this redemption, this holy, holy God, looking down through the corridors of eternity, knowing that we will become a sinful people, corrupted by Satan himself. This holy, holy God decides, even before he created man, he predestinated that he will redeem us back from Satan, in whose clutches we were, would have been. In whose clutches we would have been. I say would have been because we're talking about before time began. It was predestined to be so. We think about salvation coming to the world in the year 81. When Jesus came on the face of the earth. In the mind of God. All this was planned. You were in the plan of God. You were in the plan of God. You were in the plan of God. And the Bible tells us he has blessed us with these spiritual blessings in heavenly places. God knew that we would be corrupted by Satan himself. He breathed his time that he will redeem us through the blood of his dearly beloved son, forgiving us of our sins, not because we deserved it or are worthy or would be worthy of it, but according to the riches of his grace, pure favor that we could never have ever imagined to merit. That is what God would be doing, what he had planned. The blessings in heavenly places in Christ does not stop there. And when we talk about forgiveness of sins, just imagine, when he forgives, he says he remembers our sin no more. You sin so badly, all your life, you were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. And then you stand up one day and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and save me. I confess you as my Lord and my Savior. And all them sins that you sin, gone, cleansed, never to be remembered by God. The omniscient God who knows all things, he chooses not to remember our sin anymore. It is as if we have never sinned in his eyes. That is the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, you're not really getting this now. I am so glad that God does remember sin. Because if he remembers my sins, I would be the most miserable man in the whole world. Because unlike you, I used to sin. Unlike you. So if that is not enough, look at verse 11. In whom also, oh God, <laughs> Woo. in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. I mean, this God is something else. Knowing what we would be doing. Not, not you, me. <laughs> Knowing all the sin I would have committed. He chose me. He redeemed me. He forgave me. He adopted me. And now... I have obtained an inheritance. Yeah. 
Don't take your salvation for granted as we usually do. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. This God, this wonderful God, predestinated that after the counsel of his will, that in Jesus we have obtained an inheritance. What an endowment! What an endowment. You say, what that means? This means that Jesus being the heir of the whole universe, being the heir of the whole universe, in him we have an inheritance. He is an, we, we, become, we become an heir. Let me tell you first, what is an heir, those of you who don't know. An heir is one that has the right of inheritance in the property of another. Right? An heir, oh, I see a legal mind just say yes. An heir is one that has the right of inheritance in the property of another. So before the foundations of the earth was laid, way back in eternity past, God predestined. He decided beforehand that together with Jesus, Together with Jesus, we as his children will inherit all that belongs to him. Yes. <laughs> you, know, you, you, you don't know what I'm talking about. Huh? Not even, I know what I'm talking about. Because the Bible says, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have it entered into the heart of man. The things that God has prepared for him. Listen to Romans 8.16. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ to Jesus. So, we have an inheritance that comprises the whole universe. You know, there is this man who was very, very rich. And he knew he was going to die. So, he pleaded with God to allow God to bring some of his riches with him in heaven. He wanted to carry some. So he took his money and he bought a whole load of gold. And the, he told the people to bury him with it. And they buried him with it. And when he got up to heaven, he made it to heaven. He had this set of gold in his hand. And Peter, standing by the gates of heaven, says, Where are you going with all that pavement? <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> Let me help some of you with it. The Bible tells us that heaven is paved with transparent gold. So that's only pavement. We're fighting for pavement down here. <laughs> we have an inheritance in Christ Jesus. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We are heirs of God as his very children. As if that is not enough. As if that is not enough. To ensure that all these heavenly blessings come our way. Look at what verse 13 tells us. In whom you all tr also trusted. After that you heard the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation. Now this is, this is in our time now. Okay? This is in our time now. 
All the rest have been predestinated. This is our time now. In whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believe, you were sealed. You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. What exactly does that mean? That tells me that having been purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ and having the pledge of our inheritance, which was predestinated for us, until the actual day of redemption, until that day when Jesus will take us away, until that day of redemption when those of us who have died and our spirits have gone to be with the Lord and our bodies go back to the earth, until that day when Jesus will come to redeem our bodies, when immortality will put, when mortality will put on immortality and corruption will put up, put up, put on incorruption, and we will be caught, the bodies will be caught up to be reunited with our spirits in heaven until that day of redemption. All for now, God has sealed us. He has sealed us with that Holy Spirit of promise. That seal is to say that we belong to God. God is saying by this seal of his Holy Spirit upon us, this is my own. This one has an inheritance. This is one that has been chosen. This is one that has been forgiven. This is one that has been redeemed. This is one and all the things that we talked about. He makes sure he puts a seal upon us. You know, it's like, you ever heard about layaway? You don't have enough money to purchase an item. You come and you make a deposit and they hold the item there and they give you a card. Nobody could ever get that item without having the card that has been given to you. And when you come with your card, you can redeem that which have been paid for. That's the Holy Spirit. We belong to God and until the day of redemption, he has put that seal upon us. And as long as we carry that seal, we know we will come into our inheritance in Christ Jesus. It says we belong to God. We are only waiting on the day of redemption to come into the fullness of our inheritance in Christ Jesus. It's a tag of ownership by God placed upon us, making us his. We belong to God. So we see that we have been chosen before time began. We have been adopted as the children of God. We have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We have been forgiven of all sins. We have been given an inheritance or we come into an inheritance. And we are sealed. We are stamped. Ownership. So that we know we are assured as long as we continue in his will. So that this is the wealth that we read about in verse 3. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings 
in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The title of the message is Walking to Your Wealth in Christ. All predestined there for us. We have begun the process of having accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Now we have got to walk towards that wealth that we talk about. Turn with me in the last chapter, or rather chapter 4. This is Paul again. He says, I therefore the prisoner of our Lord Jesus beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Please listen to me. Rather, don't listen to me. Listen to the word of God. I beseech you that you walk worthy, that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you have been called. A vocation is a divine call to God's service or to the Christian life. That's the definition. Let me say that again. A vocation is a divine call to God's service, or to the Christian life. So whether you are in service or you are not in service, the call is for us to walk worthy of the vocation. Now I can go into the rest of the verses rest of the chapter. But then I will have to find other writers and I'll have to read all that they say and that will take the rest of the day if not sometime tomorrow. But if we understand just that one verse that you walk worthy, you tailor your life according to the word of God and the will of God, according to everything that God says that you should do and should not do, as long as you are walking worthy of that vocation, you are walking towards that inheritance, that wealth, that God has promised us. There is the devil that is there to ensure that you don't make it. And he's going to do it with all his might. He did it with Adam, who was without sin, pure and holy. He did it with Jesus, or he tried to do it with Jesus after his baptism. Don't think he's not going to do it for you, to you. He's going to do everything to get you to move away from that walk. He's going to get do everything, every temptation that he can think about. He's going to play with your mind. He's going to play with your bodies. He's going to play with everything. Your soul. Your intellect. Your sense of reasoning. He's going to play with everything. The only thing he can't touch is your spirit because that has been redeemed. The Bible tells us Last verse, chapter 4, verse 1. We, the onus is upon us. It's not on God. 
See all that he has done for us. He has given us the Holy Spirit to help us. We are the ones to do it. He's not going to do it for us. This is why when you say, Lord, one of the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 4, is patience. Okay? So you say, well, that's a fruit of the Spirit. But Lord, I don't have patience. Lord, give me some patience. Does he do that? Th does he just give you patience? No, because he's supposed to have patience, right? So then he gives you trials, which is the opposite, totally opposite, so that you can develop. The characteristics of God are to be developed within us. We have to work. We have to walk worthy of our vocation in every single respect. Don't think it's going to be an easy walk. I started off by saying that this is why I gave you the wealth first. If we have this wealth before us, we should be willing to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. We should be willing, knowing that there is laid up there for us an inheritance, predestined for us long before time began. It's there for the taking. Why continue in our own way and say, well, that is how I is? <laughs> Why? Why not instead of, that is how I is, why say, that's not how I am? <laughs> mm. We have been given every power to become. We have before us promises of God laid up before we came on the face of the earth. Holy, holy God, looking down and seeing sinners down the road. And look what he has predestined for us. Should we not, on this Father's Day, honor our Father in heaven and say, rather than, it's not what I want to do, but thy will be done. Each time we come into this house, we hear the word of God. It is designed to bring change to our lives, to bring us more and more like Jesus. Why do we have to become like Jesus? Because God says, for whom he did for no predestination, he predestined that we be conformed into the image of his son Jesus, that he Jesus would be the firstborn among many brethren. Do you know what it is to be able to walk shoulder to shoulder with the one who created the universe and know that he is your brother? Or oh, you didn't know that? If he's a son of God and you're a child of God, that makes him a brother. On top of being a brother, he's also a friend. He calls us friends. Shouldn't we honor him? Shouldn't we love him? Shouldn't we try our best to serve him in the way that he would have us serve him? Shouldn't we listen to him rather than listening to the devil? I mean, the devil, as compared to Jesus who gave his life for you, you would listen to the devil before you listen to God? But Adam made that mistake. And look what happened to us. But God, but God, in his grace, in his love, and his mercy, long before time began, he provided all these things for us. He's a good God. He's a wonderful God. God bless you. you
all that we heard this morning from the Word of God. All that God has predestined. It's in Jesus Christ. That is to say, if you are not in Jesus, though these things have been predestined for you, you will not come into them. It's not an automatic thing. Jesus Christ came to pay the price for our sin. Until such time that we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. Until such time that we make Jesus Christ our Lord by acknowledgement and by confession. We are still outside of Christ. We are not in Christ. So let us not think for one moment that the things that we have spoken about here, we are all, the whole world of people are entitled to it. Yet, we are entitled to it in the sense that it has been predestined to be so. But you can only come into that entitlement when you embrace the one in whom it is predestined to be. And that's Jesus Christ. It's not a question of what religious denomination you belong to. It's not a question of whether you come to this church or not. It's a question of have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and as your Lord? Have you made him Lord of your life? Have you received the gift of God, eternal life through Jesus Christ? This is what brings us into Christ and brings us into all that we have spoken about here this morning. This is when we come into the reality of the chosen. He chose in predestination, but until such time that we accept, we don't belong. So if you're here this morning and you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you may have been coming here as a matter of fact. Perhaps Friday, Sunday, prayer meeting, Bible study. That, that, that doesn't do it until such time that you open your heart and invite Jesus to come in, asking him to forgive you of your sins, acknowledging him as Savior, confessing him as Lord. It's not going to happen. So if we just bow our heads, in respect to the presence of God, Father, in the name of Jesus, your son, we thank you for all that you have done in eternity past. All that you have predestined for those that will embrace Jesus Christ, your son, as Lord and Savior. I pray, Lord, that if there is one here this morning who have not yet made that decision, one who have not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that this morning, Lord, in your presence, by your Spirit, such a one, Lord, will say, Lord, I want you to be my Savior. I want you to be Lord of my life. And if you are here and you are that person, right where you are, I just want you to raise your hand as an indication so that we will help you with a simple prayer. A prayer that will translate you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God. Is there one here? Is there one? Yes, sir, I see your hand. Praise God for you. Is there another? You may put your hand down, sir. God has seen your heart. Is there another? Anyone else will join with this gentleman here and say, I want Jesus in the balcony. Under the balcony. No one else. 
But I'm going to trust that. That's the only gentleman that's not yet born of the Spirit of God. But in the event that you stood here and you heard all that you heard, and you have not made, you have not exhibited a willingness to accept Jesus Christ, I want you to know, I must let you know this. A non-acceptance is an automatic rejection. And by not accepting, you have rejected the one who have given his life for you. The thing about it is this. You are not here by chance. God had an appointment with you. But you just turned down that appointment. But I'll tell you what, that gentleman, we're going to pray with him. And he's going to come into a wonderful experience with the Lord Jesus Christ right here and now. Sir, I'm going to ask you to come. Yes. And while he's coming, if you're here and you've never given your life to the Lord, join with him. Come and walk down here with him. Anyone else? Anyone else want to take a step into heaven this morning? I'm going to help you with a prayer, okay? If you just say it because I said it, you're not going to experience what God wants you to experience, okay? What you do is, I'm helping you with the words. If you are praying it as a prayer to God, and you're doing it with all sincerity of heart. The Bible says, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall, not me, you shall be saved. Okay? So I'm going to ask you to close your eyes so you're not distracted. And you're going to pray it, your prayer to God. You're praying it out so I will know how to lead you. And as I lead, you follow. Just make it a prayer of your heart to God. Dear God in heaven, I come to you this morning thanking you for the opportunity to stand in your presence, to acknowledge my sins before you. Lord Jesus, I have sinned. I, have, uh, I ask you for your forgiveness. I believe with all my heart. You died for my sin. You rose from the dead. And I now accept you, Jesus, as my Savior. I confess you, Jesus, as my Lord come into my heart Lord Jesus put your spirit in me and teach me to live for you by faith I receive you into my heart Lord Jesus and I thank you for saving me Amen It has already happened on condition that there is sincerity of heart. And you know something, sir? Sometimes the Lord allows me to feel things. And I can feel the sincerity of your heart. You are born a son of God this morning. This does not mean that you have not been born a son of God. You must know how you have. So here's what we're going to do. We have someone behind you. We're going to take you. He's going to take you. And he's going to show you in the Bible, starting from Genesis, 
where we were separated from God and now Jesus came and died for your sins and now you have been reconciled to God forgiven of all sins what you have received and how to, how to keep it that's important okay so go with this young man who's going to help you God bless you come on let's go <laughs> All right, we're going to sing a chorus and then we close. I come before you today. 